You're an overcomer. Come on. Anybody here overcomer this morning? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Why don't you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. How many of you know it started in the beginning? Lillis, you're familiar with that verse, aren't you? I love Miss Lillis. She's always been teased that she starts in Genesis and finishes in Revelations. Well, I, I'm not going to finish in Revelations. I won't take that long. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know how long I'll take this morning. But if you'll turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to turn there in just a minute. How many of you ever have trouble hearing the voice of God? Anybody? Hey, you know, we all struggle with that, I believe, from time to time and trying to hear God's voice. And, and, and when God created Adam... You know, God created him perfect. He was in the garden, and everything was just right. Matter of fact, we learn from the scriptures that God walked with Adam in the garden, and he talked with him face to face in the cool of the evening. Could you imagine what it must have been like to be able to walk around in the Garden of Eden and, and just have fellowship with God? I mean, here he was face to face having a great experience with God and having good things. You know, God gave him a wife, and, and he formed that woman out of Adam's rib. He put him to sleep, formed a woman, put life into her as well, and, and things were good. But God had given them instructions. He said, look, I don't want you to, to eat of this one tree, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, everything else you can have, but leave it alone. How many of you know there's a liar in town? His name's Satan, Slewfoot. He's the devil, and the devil is a liar. How many of you know he's a liar? That's his native language. He tries to tell us all kinds of things, and I, be, I would just tell you, be careful. Be aware. The devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's going to do everything that he can to get you. This morning in Sunday school, uh, we're, we're dealing with a cl uh, class. Danny, what's the title of the class? Hindering Spirits. How many of you know what a hindering spirit is? Okay, you need to go to his class if you didn't raise your hand, okay? Uh, you need to understand hindering spirits. Satan is a hindering spirit. Today we talked about Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel a little bit. And if you've never understood what the spirit of Jezebel is, you need to read up on it. You need to understand that she is a spirit of influence. She is one that comes in in deception and tries to take control, tries to influence others around you to get the job done she wants done. And so uh, when we think about that, Satan, was, a, was he, he's the one that started the Jezebel spirit. It was there before Jezebel even showed up, but they finally gave it a name. But when God created Adam and Eve, he created him to talk face to face. And if you look with me at the scripture here in chapter 3 and verse 6, read with me for just a minute. God had given the warning already. It says, but in verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The man and his wife heard a sound of the Lord coming as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Just as usual, but all of a sudden there was something different. Listen to it, he, in the cool of the day, and they hid themselves from the Lord among the trees in the garden. But the Lord called out to the man, where are you? Like God couldn't really see him, but he did. Hello, are you with me? God could see it all. Verse 10 says, "Where?" he said, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I have commanded you not to eat from? Let's pray. Father, this morning, I ask for your anointing. I pray that, Lord, today you will speak to our hearts and our minds and our spirits. And, Lord, that you will accomplish in this next few moments what you so desire to do in us. For, Lord, I've waited upon you, and I feel this is the word that you would have for us today. God, if it's not, I pray that you would change it. And, Lord, that you would accomplish what you want. Lord, I pray that, Father, you will just have your way in these next few moments now. In Jesus' name, amen. Adam and Eve had taken of the forbidden fruit. They allowed sin to enter into their heart. 
And since the fall of man, God has never spoken to man face to face again. You see, man had the privilege of being in God's presence. What an awesome thing. I, you know, that's what we look, look for now. That's what I'm living for. We sang that song a while ago, I Will Rise, you know, and I think about that song, and I think about how one day we'll be able to be with the Lord face to face. We'll be with him forevermore. What an experience it will be to see him and to know him as we can't know him like we do today. I mean, you know, we think we know him. We try to observe him and love him and worship him and honor him and, and, and we spend time with him, but it's going to be different when we get there. I'm going to tell you, it's, I'm, I'm really looking. We're just practicing. We're trying to get ready, but I, it's going to get better and better and better. How many of you know it gets sweeter as the day goes by? And I believe it's going to be an exciting time. But since the fall of man, God has not spoken to man face to face like he did in the Garden of Eden. Matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 23, it says this, The Lord banished him from the garden of Eden, talking about Adam, to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden a cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree of life. He said, you'll not go back there. You've had tree of knowledge of good and evil, but you're not going to get to the tree of life. You will not have eternal life like I had intended for you to have. But now, there's a separation between us. Since that time, God has used other methods of communication to get his message to his people. So we read in the book of Exodus, in chapter 3, God chose a, a leader, a man by the name of Moses. Moses grew up. What an interesting story. If you go back and read the story of Moses and how God allowed him to be rose up at a time when Pharaoh was trying to kill off all the Israelite babies, but God spared a little boy by the name of Moses. He wasn't even named yet, but they placed him in a little basket with pitch and tar on it and put it into the water of the Nile and not knowing what would happen, whether a hungry crocodile would come and get him or what would happen, but the princess of Pharaoh comes and pulls that baby out. And that's where the name Moses came from, drew out of the water. She drew him out. And Moses was chosen for a purpose, for a time, such a time as that, if you will. And Moses was pulled out. And later Moses finds himself leaving Pharaoh after being raised in Pharaoh's court, being raised there in, in that big city of Egypt. And he winds himself going off into another place because he ran for his life. He's watching sheep on the backside of a hill one day, and all of a sudden Moses sees a bush that is burning, but it's not being consumed. It would be like looking at one of these plants here today. Fire was roaring out of it, but the green leaves were still green. It wasn't burning up. Have you ever watched a Christmas tree when it burns? Have you ever noticed that a Christmas tree, you know, after it's been cut for a few days, you know, it dries up pretty quick, and as soon as a little bit of flame hits it, it goes woof like that, and it's gone. There's nothing left but a few little sticks and a, and a, and a, a main trunk coming down, and it burns up fast. In the middle of the back side of the woods, on the side of a hill, Moses is standing there, and he sees this bush that's got a roaring fire coming out of it, and he can't figure out why is this bush not burning up. Why is this bush not about disintegrating? What's going on? And so he goes up a little closer, and as he gets closer to that bush, the Lord says, you're standing on holy ground. Take off your shoes. How many of you know he was in the presence of the Lord? First time Moses had heard God's voice in this way, God began to speak to him out of the bush. The voice of the Lord began to speak to him. Was God the bush? No, he wasn't the bush. But God got his attention through the burning bush and began to speak to him. Moses began to recognize the voice of God. And as God began to speak to him, he began to listen, and he listened, and he listened. And, and before long, God said, look, I'm calling you to deliver my people out of the hands of Egypt. Are you with me? He says, I'm calling my, my people out, and you're going to be the deliverer, and I want you to go. And he says, how will they know how, that I'm the one? He says, who shall I say sent me? And he says, say that I am sent you. How many of you know the great I am this evening? Amen. He said, look, 
I am him who made you and delivered you and set you free. He said, and this is what you'll do. Take your staff and that staff, if you'll use that staff, the rod of God, if you will, he says, it will be a witness and it will testify that I have sent you. So Moses goes, and for years, for years and years, God delivers them. He delivers them out of Egypt. He takes them through the wilderness, and God gives the children of Israel the word from God. Moses never really sees God face to face, but he enters into God's presence up on top of the mountain. In the presence of God, the glory of God gets all over him so that when he comes back down the mountain, you read the story, he comes back down the mountain and the glory of God is all over him because he had been in God's presence. And he had to wind up wearing, uh, if you will, a cloth over his face, a, a shield, if you would, because when people would see him coming back from God's presence, they would see the glory of God. They knew he had been there. But after a period of time from being out of God's presence, the glory would begin, the radiance would begin to fade. And so Moses began to wear this cloth. People wouldn't know for sure when and when he wasn't, you know, in the glory of God. God never had the opportunity to see, or Moses never saw God's face once again like Adam had seen him. For years, God used prophets in the Old Testament. No one heard the voice of God on their own, but it was through the prophets of God that he would use and as we read through the stories in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we begin to realize that God used men of old to bring the word of the Lord to the people, just as he did through Moses. There was a man by the name of Eli. Somebody you might remember Eli. Eli was a prophet of God, and Eli started out great, as many prophets of God do. But after time had gone by, his sons had become evil, and they had allowed themselves to do things that were ungodly. In the temple, they had done ungodly things. Eli couldn't stop them. You remember a man and a woman who had prayed, for, or a woman had prayed for a son? She had prayed, and she goes in. Her name was Hannah, and she said, God, would you give me a son? Eli found her at the altar thinking she was drunk, and he said to her, Woman, what are you doing here in the, in the temple praying or, or crying out drunk like you are? She says, I'm not, I'm not drunk. I'm just crying out to God because I want a son. And God gives, him, gives her that son. A year later, she comes back with a son. After she had weaned the child, she brought the child back to, to Eli and says, I promised God if he'd give me a child, a son, I would give him back to the Lord. So he gives him back. She gives him back to Eli to raise in the temple for God's service. So Eli, from the time that he was weaned from his mama, he had been the helper there in the temple with Eli. And I want you to pick up in your Bibles, if you will, look with me at this story for just a minute. In 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, time has passed. Eli is growing up older. He's getting so old. His vision is going. His sons are wicked. Samuel has, has become a young man serving in the temple and helping Eli. And it says in verse 1 in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 10, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. How many of you know what he said? The, Lord's, the word of the Lord was rare. Many people had not heard from God in a long time. It was dry. It was like, God, we need something fresh. We need something new. We need to hear from you. And so Eli serving God, had not heard from the Lord in quite some time. And he says, there were not many visions given, but one night in verse 2 it says, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. I could just imagine Eli had a favorite place in the temple. It was a place that he had laid some straw or some other things in a sackcloth or something, and that was his bed. And he would go and he'd lay down, and, and the Bible tells us as you read on, Eli was a big old fat man. He was a big fat man. And he laid down, and he didn't take long to go to sleep. But it says here in verse 2, that night he went and laid down. And it says in verse 3, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was then. 
And he says, and then the Lord called to Samuel. I want you just for a moment to imagine Eli's laying over here in this part of the temple. And Samuel goes over, and he's over here by the ark, the ark of the covenant. He had come into the temple, and he found a place where he had grown up. This young man knew nothing else because you got to remember, Mama gave him back to Eli when he was just a little baby. He had just been weaned. He was just getting old enough to be able to walk and to do things. And he, gave, he was given to Eli to serve the Lord. And so the only daddy he really remembers and the only mama he remembers is a big old fat man over there, the man of God. And he's over here and he's laying down one night. And all of a sudden, he hears Eli. Or he hears Samuel, rather. Samuel. And Samuel jumps up and he says, here I am, master. And he goes over and he says, here I am. Did you call me? Did you call me? I'm here. And Eli looks at Samuel and says, no, I didn't call you. Go lay down, son. I don't know what you're hearing. So Samuel goes back and he lays down. And he falls back asleep and all of a sudden he hears again a voice calling, Samuel. Samuel raises up. He says, oh, I better run over there and see what Eli wants one more time. Something must be going on. And he goes, oh, what is it you want, sir? I, I'm here to serve. What can I do? He said, I didn't call you. Go lay down. So he goes back and he said, man, I don't understand this. And he goes and he lays back down. And he gets to the other side. He lays down, falls asleep a third time. Samuel. Samuel gets up. He's not running as fast. He says, I know I heard something. Yes, sir, here I am. What can I do for you? I didn't call you. Go lay down, son. And all of a sudden, Eli says, you know what? I believe God's speaking to Samuel. Matter of fact, up to that point, the Bible says that Samuel had never heard from the Lord, but God was doing something new. There was a transition fixing to take place, and God was raising up a new man of God. Eli says, son, go lay back down again, and the next time you hear that voice, if he calls you again, he says, I want you to just sit up and say, here I am, master, what can I do? How can I serve you? So Samuel goes back and he lays down. Eli goes back to sleep. And during the night, the scripture says, a fourth time, the voice of the Lord comes to Samuel. It says, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel gets up and he says, yes, Lord, speak to me. What is it? And God begins to reveal to him what's about to take place. Remember earlier in the passage here, we read where it was rare in those days to hear from the Lord. But God began to speak to a young man, a young boy, and he said, here I am, Master. In the rest of that passage, God begins to share with him what's about to take place. He gives him the future. He prophesies through him. The next morning, I'm not going to get into the whole passage there, but Eli gets up and he said, did the Lord come to you again? He said, yes. What did he have to say? Could you imagine? Because the word that he received was, Eli's sons are very evil and very wicked. And you haven't done anything to stop them, Eli. And God's fixing to remove your lamp from your life. That's basically what it was about. It wasn't long when we read the story where the Philistines go to war with Israel. The two sons of Eli go off to war, leading out with the Ark of the Covenant. They are killed. The Ark is stolen. And when the word comes back to Eli, who's sitting there at the city gate in his chair, he hears the word. The Bible says he fell over backwards, dead. God fulfilled the word that he had spoken to Samuel. How many of you know we need to hear the voice of God? It's important to hear God's voice. 
This morning, I brought up here with me a couple of scarves. And I just want to share with you just a second. One of these scarves here represents man. The other represents God. And I want you to understand today that God and man were created. Or God wasn't created, but God created man. And when God created man, he had fellowship with him in the garden. You remember the story I told you at the beginning with Adam and Eve? Communication was great. Everything was going well. God was having a great time. Man was having a great time, but sin entered in. And when sin entered in, it caused there to be a knot tied between God and man, not allowing them to have the communication that they once had. The flow of communication was stopped. But God had another plan. And he brought with him this plan. This plan represents this other scarf. How many of you know that this scarf here represents Jesus Christ this morning? Jesus was God's plan to restore the communication with God and man. You see, the Bible tells us that we were all sinners. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated love, his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How many of you know he died for you? He died for your sins so that you might have everlasting life. After Jesus died on the cross and went into the grave and rose again on the third day, it says after about 40 days on the face of the earth, the Bible declares that Jesus went out and he was standing there with his disciples and all of a sudden he ascended up into the heavens to be with the Father. Guess where Jesus is now? He's at the right hand of the Father. No longer is he or here on the face of the earth to be our Lord and Savior but he's there in heaven doing something very special for you and I. How many of you know what Jesus is doing? The Bible says he is interceding for you and I. Because of Jesus, now the communication between God and man has been restored because of Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? How many of you know that Jesus loves you this morning? Jesus cares for you. God cares for you. And he has a plan for our lives. And I want you to understand this morning, just as sin comes into the world, Jesus came into the world to remove the sin from our lives. God restores. He becomes that intercessor. He becomes the one to bridge the gap between you and I so that we can have communication once again with God. Today, because Christ has become our mediator we have direct communication with God. We don't have to wait for a young man by the name of Samuel to hear from God's voice. We can each hear from God today. Can I hear an amen? amen. We all have the ability to hear from God. You know, the Old Testament relied on prophets. But church, today we have the Holy Spirit here. Come on. The Holy Spirit is, if you will, the prophet of God today, speaking to our hearts what God would say to our lives. You see... It's important for us to hear God's voice. How many of you know it's important to hear God's voice? You know, Psalms 37 says this, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. How many of you believe that? The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. If that's true, if the Lord orders our steps, we must learn to recognize God's voice. How can you walk in the direction God's leading you if you don't hear his voice? You've got to stop and listen. You've got to hear the voice of God. You see, think back to Abraham for just a minute. Let me take you back to the old book of Genesis. Abraham had prayed for a son. He was believing for a son. God gave him a son finally. And that son that he had, Isaac, he was, he was you know, just a great, you know, or, yeah, he was just a great man of God. He was a great young boy. And God said, look, you know, you love this boy so much. He says, but I want to see how much you trust me. Remember the story? He says, I want you to take this young boy and I want you to go and offer him as a sacrifice up on the mountain that I'll tell you. Abraham gathers up all the firewood. He gathers up the fire pot. He gets his mule and his donkeys together. He gets some of his servants, and he travels down the road a few miles until he gets to the place God said, this is it. This is where I want you to go. Now, this is a great mountain, Mountain of Moriah here. 
As he goes on, he says, I want you to go up. He told his servants to wait here. He put all the firewood on his son's back, and they started up the mountain. On the way up there, you remember the story? They get up there, and all of a sudden, the boy looks at his daddy and says, Daddy, I see the firewood. I see the fire. I said, but where is the sacrifice? And he said, son, don't worry. The Lord will provide. He gets up to the top of the mountain. He lays out all the wood, and then he binds his son hand and foot, and he lays him on the altar. How many of you know if Abraham had not learned to hear the voice of God the day in that moment that he drew that, that knife out of his sheath and he was about to take the life of his very son that he had prayed for, the promise, if he had not recognized the voice of God, he would have taken his son's life. But God spoke to him and says, Stop, for I know now that you love me. I know now that you trust me. You see, Abraham had come to the decision that if God gave him the boy once, he could do it again. God could raise him back up. That was his, his thought. But God says, stop. And as he stopped, he looked up, and there was a ram in the thicket, the Bible declares. And so he went over and he caught the ram, put it on the altar. They offered the sacrifice up. And that's where we hear the story. He says, and the Lord shall provide. How many of you know God does provide? If Abraham had not heard the voice of God, the promise would have been killed. But he listened and he heard the voice. He recognized it. Let me just give you a couple other examples in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 8, verse 28, there's a story of an evangelist by the name of Philip. Philip had left the city of Jerusalem. He was traveling and he had been ministering and doing great things. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God came to him and spoke to him and said, Look, I want you to go out into the desert because there's a man traveling in a chariot and I want you to witness to him. How many of you know that if Philip had not heard the voice of God, the Ethiopian eunuch would have never gotten saved? He would have never gotten baptized. But God chose him for such a time as that to do it. But he had to hear the voice of God. Say, well, pastor, that's okay. Somebody else would have got him. How many of you know that God doesn't want to wait for somebody else? He wants you and he wants me to do his will. Can I hear an amen? You see, it's not up to somebody else. Look a little farther in Acts chapter 10. There's a story of a fellow by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius has a vision, and he sends some men to check on him. On the way there, Peter has a vision himself. If Peter had not listened to the voice of God, Cornelius and his family would have never been saved. But because he heard God's voice, not only Cornelius, but his whole household was saved on that occasion. In Acts chapter 16, Paul, on his missionary journey, he is preparing to go on through Asia and continue to do his ministry but all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, he hears a voice calling to him. And he said it was like a man calling from Macedonia saying, Come, come over here. We need your help. We need your help. I want you to understand, had, Phil, had uh, uh, Paul not heard that voice and listened to the voice of God, there's a whole group of people that would have lost out on salvation. I say all that to say this. If we don't learn to hear God's voice, if we don't hear the Lord, how are we going to respond to God's call on our lives? Is it possible we'll miss out on what God wants us to do? Think about it for just a minute. Could it be some of your own family that God's wanting to touch? Could it be your coworker? Could it be your neighbor? Who is it? The other afternoon or morning, I was, I was going up to the post office and I had run a couple errands, and Diana was out this week, so I was doing some of her regular duties that she has to do. And, and I got up to the post office, and I saw one of my neighbors. I never get to see him. I walked over to him. I said, hey, how are you doing? It's so good to see you. It's a shame I have to come to the post office to visit with you. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, he lives just across the street down in a couple houses, and, and I, I kept thinking, boy, I need to talk. I've been wanting to witness to him, been wanting to talk to him, and I never see him. I never see him out there. And so I walked up, and I said, how are you doing? And the Lord began to deal with me. I was listening to the voice of God, and the God, God spoke to me and said, look, now's your chance. How many of you know sometimes there are appointed times? 
And as I stood there in the post office, people were coming and going. He was on his way with his key to go open his box. I looked at him and I said, how are things going? He said, good. I said, how about your wife? Oh, we're good. We're doing good. I said, the Holy Spirit prompted me. I said, tell me, where, where do you guys go to church? Do y'all go anywhere? And he says, well, he said, we're, we're not real sociable people. We watch TV church. I said, oh, okay. And I wasn't going to let that stop me. And I just continued on. And I said, let me just ask you one question. I just, just got to ask you this. I said, have you ever asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior? Man, that was the Holy Spirit prompting. It was, it was not me. It was God. And he, he looked at me with great hesitation, and he said, yes. And I said, I am so thankful because I have worried about you and your wife for a long time because I've never had the opportunity to ask you, and I would feel so bad that if you didn't make it into heaven and I have missed my chance to talk to you about Jesus. How many of you know I still going to work on that man? I believe he, he's given his heart to Christ. He said he had. He's not a very sociable person. I've not had very many opportunities to talk to him over the years. But I still believe that God can do great things in his life. How many of you know that? Yes. We've got to hear the voice of God. Yes. We've got to learn to recognize God's voice when he speaks to us. Just as when Samuel was laying in his bed and the Holy Spirit came and woke him and said, Hey, get up. And he runs over to Eli. He had not recognized whose voice it was. He just heard his name being called. Let me tell you what. God's calling your name this morning. God is calling you. And he wants you to respond to the call and to hear his voice so that you can accomplish what God wants to do. Can I hear it? Amen. You see, we need to hear God's voice. We need to be sensitive to his leading. You say, well, pastor, how can I hear God's voice? Well, let me just say it this way. How can we train ourselves? I believe, first of all, by spending more time with God. You know, I, I have to get into the Word, not just my morning devotions, but I have to get into the Word and read more and read more and read more so that God can put into my spirit. God can speak to me. How many of you know God speaks to you through his Word? Amen? Amen. Spending time with him in prayer. Spending time with him in prayer is so important. Spend time with God. And then you've got to learn to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. One of the things I try to pray every service, every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Lord, help us to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We pray that in the first part and before Sunday school. We're out here with the choir. I pray, Lord, help us not just to rush through the songs. How many of you know it's good to sing songs? It's good to worship God. But we want to be sensitive to what God wants to do because God moves even during the worship. Come on. God may want to heal somebody during the middle of worship. God may want to save some soul during the middle of worship. Come on. It's not just in the preaching of the word, but God may want to bring deliverance into somebody's life. We need to be sensitive to the moment to what God is doing. So it's important that we be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Third, I believe we need to take action when we hear God speak. If you think God's speaking to you, take a step of faith. Come on, get out of the boat. Can I hear an amen? Amen. A lot of times we hear something, but we never act on it. God wants us to move forward. He wants us to launch out and to do what he's called. Move forward. Come on, take action when you hear God speaking to you. And then remember, God wants to order your steps. When you hear that voice and you start to recognize it, the more you hear it, the more you'll recognize it, the more often you'll walk in obedience to God's voice. Do you think that Samuel... On that first occasion, it all of a sudden just clicked. I believe it took him a while before he heard clearly all the time what God was saying. You see, God wants to do this. We've got to listen for his voice. 
I got one more little quick story I want to tell you before I close this morning. Danny touched on it just a little bit in Sunday school. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah had just called fire down from heaven. Great, great story. Go read chapter 18. Elijah had just had a magnificent victory. And all the prophets of Baal, Elijah, he slaughtered because we're going to choose between God or Baal. Who are you going to serve? And God showed up on the scene. Baal couldn't do anything, but God showed up. As a result, Elijah goes and he slaughters every one of the prophets of Baal. He kills every one of them in front of all the people. He says, because you said so, we're going to do this. And so they all died. As a result of what took place, a woman by the name of Jezebel. Anybody remember Jezebel? How many of you have heard that phrase used before, Jezebel? One. Go read the story in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. I ain't got time to read it all to you today. But Jezebel, and you, there's more stories in there about her. She has a conniving, evil spirit. She wants control over everything. Do you realize that she could say things to her husband and get him to do her dirty work? A Jezebel spirit is somebody that comes to you and says something to you. You didn't have no thought about anything about this thing, and all of a sudden it was just one little thought that Jezebel said to Ken, and Ken gets his spirit all ruffled, and he's going to go deal with it. Hello? That's a Jezebel right there. They get you to do their dirty work. Well, Jezebel was angry because she worshipped the prophets of Baal and the Baal himself, and she didn't believe in God, and she was angry. And so in the first part of chapter 19, she says, let, let Elijah know if something doesn't happen between now and tomorrow that he is still alive. He, she was going to take his life. So Elijah, the man of God of faith and power, he runs for his life in fear because Jezebel's out to get him. And he takes off on a trek and he goes and goes and goes without eating. And he finally goes through, the, he gets to this place where there's a broom tree. God refreshes him and he continues his journey. He goes on until he gets to a cave. And in chapter 19 and verse 11, all of a sudden he's sitting there and God's looking at, at uh, Elijah. He said, Elijah, why are you here in this cave? What are you doing here? You're a man of God. You're a man of faith. Who are you running from, this Jezebel? How many of you know greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? But Elijah had let it get under his skin, and he ran. And in verse 11, it says, The Lord said to Elijah, he says, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains and tore them apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was there, an earthquake came, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire came, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came, a gentle whisper. And this is what I want you to hear. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and he stood at the mouth of the cave. And the voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? I want you to understand, sometimes God will use visions to speak to you. Sometimes God will use dreams to speak to you. Sometimes God will even use angels to speak to you. We read it in the scripture. But I want you to know most of the time, God's not going to show up in the wind, the fire, and the rain. Come on, he's not going to show up in the storm. He's not going to show up in visions and dreams and angels. But he's going to come to you in that still, small voice. And he will come and he will say to you, And that's when you need to respond and say, yes, Lord, I will go. Yes, Lord, I'll go to my neighbor's house and I'll carry them that apple pie. Yes, Lord, I'll go to them and I'll, I'll tell them about Jesus. Yes, Lord, that aunt of mine that's a pain in the behind, hello. I'm going to love her and I'm going to do something kind to befriend her. Come on. You hear me? Sometimes... God will just say something to you in that still, small voice. And he'll say, look, I need you to go over there and lay hands on Tom Civic. Because Tom Civic 
He's got a pain in the very middle of his back. Been bothering him. We say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Go over to Danny and say, Danny, it's going to be all right. He's still Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? I want you to understand, God doesn't always come with a mighty shout. God doesn't come in the storm and the rains. He doesn't come in the wind and the earthquake all the time. Elijah had to realize as he walked out of the mouth of that cave that it was just a still, small voice. Church, what I want you to understand this morning is that we need to learn to recognize the voice of God. Sometimes God's warning you of dangers and perils that are ahead of you. How many of you want to be warned? There's a bad curve ahead. Somebody took the sign down. Caution. Beware. Slow down. Get ready. How many of you know God wants to speak to your hearts today?